Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Raymond Long. Uh, I'm an engineer in the Red Hat Core Kernel uh, Group. So uh, today, my topic, um, my presentation is about uh, C Group V2. So uh, first of all, I want to introduce what is a C Group. Uh, in the Linux kernel, C Group actually is a shorthand notation for uh, the name Control Group, which is a just a collection of process that are bounded by the same criteria and associated with a given set of resources that you want to control. Um, and SQL gives you a mechanism by which you can structure uh, all the processes in the system hierarchically, uh, like a tree structure, and define how much resource you want to allocate for each group of uh, processes. And do it in a way that are controllable and easier to, to manage. And control group, C group, together with namespace, form the basis of uh, what we can do uh, with container. So container is basically um, required two essential kernel technology. One is C group, the other one is namespace. Without these two kernel technology, uh, you can't have a container um, at all. And there are many kernel resources that can be controlled by the C group. Like uh, you can control how much CPU you want uh, each uh, group of process to have, uh, how much memory uh, allocate to each set of process, and the amount of block I.O., um, the bandwidth, and the relative importance, et cetera. And what device are associated uh, with each of the C group, you can also control that and also all through the, the network, like the, the bandwidth, the priority, et cetera. And you can also control how much process ID you want to allocate to a set of processes. Because one way you, you allow uncontrollable um, number of PID with the processes, then what uh, one um, program can do is, is you can try to spawn as many processes as possible, you use up all the post PID space, then all the other applications will be start for PID and they can't start or they have problem uh, working. So it's a form of denial, denial of service test. So sometimes you want to process, protect how many uh, PID you want to be allocated for each set of processes. So um, how to use control group? And from the kernel perspective, um, the process hierarchy is presented like as a directory tree in a SQL virtual file system. So each directory in the tree have a set of uh, SQL control file that can be read or written into, and you can write value into those control files to, con to uh, associate a resource limit uh, with each of the group of process mm -hmm. that are in the SQL. Or, and then you can also read the data out uh, for some uh, state information as well as some uh, statistical count that you want to collect like how much memory are currently consumed by a given set of processes. And each process, or every process running a system associated with one of the directory in the hierarchy. And the default is the word, which is the top level hierarchy. If you've done nothing, all the processes are in the top level uh, directory. And you have to explicitly move them to subdirectory and then where you can set resource limit and control how much they consume uh, in the system. And you will look at the, um, the, the control file in each of the directory. You can see that there are a set of uh, um, control files that start with the prefix C group. They are associated with the core C group. Um, and then there is a set of files. And each of the controller in the C group have its own set of control files. Like, uh, in this case, I'm showing the CPU set. Uh, you have um, CPU set, CPU exclusive. This is a binary file that, uh, that tells you whether you want uh, all the CPU within that C group to be exclusive to that C group and not used by other C group. If so, then you set it to one. Otherwise, uh, you just leave it as zero, and et cetera. All these files, uh, the files that are listed in this case are associated with C group v V1. C group V2 is somewhat different, um, and I will talk about that uh, 
in some one of the exercise. So, how you can use SQL? Uh, there are several ways you can use SQL. Um, one way that people can try to, when you want, you want to play around with SQL, you can try to manually um, manipulate the, or create a SQL uh, word subdirectory in the virtual file system to create new SQL. Um, and then move, manually move the process from, from the wood SQL to uh, another SQL by just uh, echoing the process ID into, uh, into that SQL uh, control file. And in, in general, uh, people can also use uh, some tools like uh, CG create, CG execute, etc., uh, to manage SQL. And, and, but the majority of cases, uh, you are using um, some um, middleware layer like uh, Docker, RxC, uh, or CSMD that manage SQL um, for you. So you don't have to worry about uh, how to use SQL. You just set some, uh, uh, you define your policy choices, and then the, the system software will manage that automatically for you, and you don't have to worry about the, the detail of how SQL works and how, much, uh, how you are going to manage it. Okay, in, ter um, in terms of internal, um, the SQL consists of two major parts. Uh, there's a core that is responsible for hierarchically um, managing the process and associate the process to each set of uh, uh, SQL. And then there is a SQL controller, which is the, where the action is. It defines how, um, there are many different controllers. Each controller controls one uh, type of resources. And those resources are typically, um, um, you can along, manage the resource along the hierarchy so you can set different limits uh, for different SQL. Uh, but there are also some uh, controllers that are not really um, trying to manage resource. They are more like a, some kind of utility controller that do some certain functions for you uh, that may not be directly associated with the resource consumption uh, used by the process. Um, they do things like accounting and control. So uh, the currently available uh, controller, at least for SQL V1, is uh, the board I.O. And then there's a CPU, um, which control how much CPU you get uh, for each of the process in the SQL. And also there's a CPU accounting that just give you um, certain accounting information like how much CPU time it has been used by the process in the SQL, etc. So, uh, so CPU accounting is not a really a resource controller. It's more like uh, for, for accounting purposes. And then you have the CPU set which control um, uh, the, post, the CPU as well as the memory node affinity of each of the process. And then you have the device SQL control most device can be used by each of SQL. Freezer is, um, is a kind of um, control type uh, C controller that um, you can use the freezer to kind of freeze the process. Um, so you, and then you can when, and do something. Uh, uh, so when you freeze the process, it basically put it to, to sleep and you are, it's not going to execute anymore until you unfreeze it at a later date. So doing the freezing, when it's freeze, you can do something about it, like uh, you can migrate to some other places or to another system, et cetera, and then we cite there. So, and then there is a um, huge TLB uh, C group that basically <coughs> allow you to manage how much uh, huge, t huge pages, uh, huge TLB pages you can associate with each of the C group. And then there's a memory controller that monitoring and controlling how much memory you can, each of uh, the process in each of SQL can consume in total. Um, Netcast and priority are used uh, for networking purposes. And then there's a perf event um, controller. It's more, again, it's a control type of uh, controller. It didn't, add, this is not actually a resource, but is used to associate um, a specific um, C group that 
with the perf tool so that uh, when you use perf tool you can control um, one of the options you can use to select the process you use is you can select all the process within a SQL uh, to, to do instrumentation on them. So this is where the perf event come in. And then you have the PID SQL that control how much PID you want to allocate to the process within the SQL, as well as the RDMA SQL, um, controlling the resource related to remote DMA. Okay, SQL controller and hierarchy. So um, with the original, um, the, the V1 SQL, each of which can have their own process hierarchy. So if you look at the, um, let me, so, okay. So, uh, So this is um, in the, under the sysfs uh, SQL directory, you can see that there are a bunch of subdirectory. So each of the subdirectory are associated with one type of controller. So you have a one subdirectory for both I/O, uh, CPU, CPU set, device, etc. And you look into each of the subdirectory and you will see a bunch of uh, files that are related to um, this other C group. The one that's with the PIVX C group are associated with the C group core, and as well as the notify on release, release agent, and task. So you want to move um, task from one C group to the other, you just echo the, um, the process ID into the task file, and it will move the, the file over to that particular SQL. And SQL pop will show you um, what process are in that SQL. You can see that um, there are a lot of process in the root directory because by default, all the process go into the, the root uh, SQL. Unless you move it to uh, one of the subdirectory underneath it. Okay, um, the, uh, the flexibility of, and you, you can also combine one or two controller into the same hierarchy, like in the, case, in the case of V1, we usually combine the CPU and CPU accounting controller into uh, one um, uh, hierarchy. Um, but then the, because of the flexibility, you can combine different things. And so different distro may have a range way in a slightly different way. So, um, so, um, so it, it, there's no standard or hardware is the best way to do thing in V1. So, and it depends on the, what middleware layer you use to manage SQL. Uh, in, the, in our case, we use SysMD that manage the SQL for you, but other distro may use some other uh, middleware tools uh, for a similar purpose, and they may do things in a somewhat different way. And also there are, there are cases where one controller may want to cooperate with another controller uh, to manage a certain type of resources. Um, and in that case, you, you just can't really do it because the two controllers may be in a two, different, two separate hierarchy with a completely different structure. So one process um, in one hierarchy may be in a, in a completely different position in the other hierarchy. So you, you just can't uh, coordinate between two different controllers and do, doing things in a meaningful way. And this is where C group V2 come in. C group V2, uh, unlike V1, you can have separate directory. For V2, there's only one hierarchy, uh, what we call the unified hierarchy, and all the controllers are in the same hierarchy. And internally, uh, within the Kernel community, we, 
we call the, the V1 controller uh, uh, in the, what we call the legacy hierarchy, while the hierarchy used by V2 controller are uh, either called default or the unified hierarchy. So how we can use a unified hierarchy? Um, by default, all the uh, a controller can either be in, v, in V1 or in V2. You can't be uh, in V1 and V2 simultaneously because uh, um, the controller only knows how to manage one set of hierarchy. So you can't have one controller in both in more than one hierarchy and you get confused. And by default, any V2 usable um, controller that are not bound to V1 will be attached to V2. So uh, you can use an uh, option like um, signal V1 boot command line to force which, um, which controller should not be bound to V1. In that case, they will all bind to the V2. And one new feature that are in V2 but not in V1 is the concept of delegation where you can, a less privileged user uh, is allowed to, to manage the, uh, the C group in a certain limited way, like moving process to one C group to another one. Um, usually, in, in the case of V1, you have to be wood to do that. But in V2, um, you, you use the right option, um, a normal user can also move process from one C group to the other. Um, So, um, unlike the, the legacy hierarchy, um, a controller in the unified hierarchy is not enabled by default, except uh, when uh, in the wood directory where they are all enabled in the wood. But underneath the wood, you have to explicitly enable each of controller um, for, for each level of uh, directory hierarchy. And the way to enable it is to use the um, subtree control file so you want to, for instance, you want to enable CPU controller um, for all the child CPU underneath the current uh, directory. Then what you need to do is uh, you echo plus CPU into the CPU subtree control file. Uh, you want to disable it, just echo minus CPU. Mean remove the CPU controller from all the uh, child CPU that you have. Um, So if a controller is not enabled in C group, uh, the controller setting at the nearest ancestor C group is where those resources are being controlled. Uh, for instance, you can have, uh, in the unified hierarchy, you can have a, um, first you can have wood uh, directory, and then there's an A, directory A, and then underneath it there's a directory B, and sub directory C, etc. And under wood, you can also have uh, another directory uh, D. If you enable CPU, Oh, sorry. Uh, well, for what CPU is enabled by default, and you can, when you use, um, when you echo plus CPU into sub two control file, uh, then both A and B should have CPU enabled, but not B and C. In order to enable B and C, you have to go to the, um, the directory A and then echo the plus CPU into the into the sub two control file within the, the A directory and, and so on. Um, yeah, there's a um, there's another here. CPU should be enabled here also. So um, in this particular case, uh, all the uh, B and C because they don't have CPU control enabled, then all the forces underneath uh, B and C. We group together with A and manage by the same controller setting in the directory A. So uh, it's as if the subdirectory doesn't exist at all for that particular controller. So, uh, so you can have other controller enabled in B and C, but not um, in, in those cases, uh, the process within B and C are managed by the setting that are defined by that particular, uh, uh, by the control file in that directory. Um, but if the controller isn't enabled, then you use the setting within the, the nearest ancestor, that, uh, the control setting for the process within uh, the subdirectory underneath here.
Okay. Um, one, other, one major difference between the C group V1 and V2 is, is, is that uh, in V1, um, tasks are, are managed in, um, on a flat level. So you can have individual flat put in different um, C group, but in the case of V2, the default is that uh, um, you manage the task on the, on, the, on the process level. So you can have one process and all is associated flat in one C group or in another one. But you can't have part of the, some of the flat in one C group and the other flat or on the second, on, on another C group. That was not allowed in C group B2. Um, that should be fine for most of the controller, except for the CPU controller, which requires flat level control. And about, about three years ago, uh, people start to work on this CPU V2 controller, and they have some disagreement on how to manage flat, and that lead to um, the development stop for almost 18 months uh, when they are arguing with each other was the best way to, to do uh, flat level management. And this is where um, the SQL flat mode comes in. And finally, um, we reach a consensus of what, how to do with the, uh, the new flat mode support. So uh, in that case, only some selected controller uh, are regarded as uh, flat, uh, flat mode enabled. So they can be used in in, when the FEMO is enabled, uh, but not the other. Um, an example of FEMO uh, controller is the CPU controller, and, and an example of non FEMO, which we call um, the domain controller, is the memory. Because for memory, um, all the process, all, all the thread within the same process are sharing the same set of uh, virtual address space. So you can't have uh, um, different control for different thread. So it just doesn't make sense. So the, the way of uh, using the thread mode is that there is a special um, control file called C type, C group dot type. So um, uh, in the diagram here, um, you want to use um, the thread mode, then you echo the, um, the screen threaded into the uh, C group dot type file. So once, after you do that, this C group becomes what we call a flatted C group. And the parent of a flatted C group uh, is in a special state, what we call the threaded domain. Um, but um, another sibling within the same uh, directory level can remain a, a domain C group, so it's not threaded. Only this one is, and that's a, and so this private domain has to manage children that uh, some of them are private, while the other remain uh, non private. And a private um, C group and all its descendants uh, are what we call a private subtree. Once a C group is private, then when you create a subdirectory, it will be private automatically. Um, but if you have an existing um, directories, you have some existing child and you change it into the one the C group in the into a credit C group, then the, your child is not credit by default. And it, it don't become, it's, it's uh, going into the reverse state that you can't use it until you ch either change it to flat or you remove credit more from your, from your parent. And also there are some behavior different between the C group V1 and V2 controller. And all the V1 controller are developed independently over time at different time in the development process. So um, they, they have uh, somewhat different naming and usage convention. And one V1 controller may look very different from, from the other one. And when people are working on V2, one of the desired objective is to make the naming and usage convention more consistent. So uh, I will show you some of the control files that are now available with V2. They look 
more or less similar in terms of the naming and uh, the semantic. And another goal of Design V2 is uh, to trim out uh, some feature that we, we, uh, we seldom use or is not that useful. Um, so we look at the V2 controller, they have less control than what we currently have in V1. Um, it doesn't mean that they won't get into V2 eventually, it's just that uh, we point it to have justification in order we can add those features into V2. And people don't want to do it just for sake because it's available in V1. Um, they want a good reason to do it. And as long as people can provide the justification, I, I believe uh, you can request that some feature be enabled in V2 as well. They are currently in V1. Uh, about, um, about SQL migration, um, SQL even is still the pre used predominantly in most Linux distribution uh, because of the fact that SQL V2 isn't complete yet. There's still some controller under development. Um, like um, for, for CPU set, oh. For CPU set, it just recently go into the 5.0 kernel, and the feature um, controller it, for V2 is uh, currently being discussed uh, upstream, and most likely it will go into 5.1, I believe. And there also, um, for the huge TLB controller, it haven't been decided whether we, we need to have it available in V2 uh, at the moment, so, um, so it depends on whether there is requirement to do that or not. And of this V1 controller, um, the device controller, the NetCRS and Net Priority controller will not be supported in V2. Instead, um, they should be managed by using the EPPF uh, program attached to each of SQL. Because um, one of the features that are, in, uh, that are newly added in SQL is that you can attach a EPPF program to each of SQL. So you want to manage networking or manage device, then use your PPPF program to do it instead of uh, explicitly uh, have a controller uh, in the C group to do that. So uh, Unify hierarchy do have uh, a number of advantages, but they also have some um, drawbacks. The primary disadvantage is the fact that because you only have one hierarchy, so you want different combination of uh, different controller setting, then what you get is you, you will create a lot more subdirectory, a lot more C group that you need to manage. And so this proliferation of C group is the result of um, the fact that we only have one single hierarchy. And there's another issue with, with that is um, um, currently, when you you have to individually enable each of the controller within each of the SQL, um, but you do it um, on layer by layer, so you can have. Um, let's go back to this. So if you have uh, the controller like uh, CPU controller enabled in here. Um, uh, let's say you don't want a CPU controller to enable it here, but you need it in this in a child CPU. You can't do that. You have to enable CPU controller in, in the middle CPU before you can enable it in the CPU underneath it. So, I, so you have to get it. So along the, the whole tree, uh, you have to be enable it one by one before you can go to the, to the lid. So you can't have... Um, it, it doesn't force it back. Mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't like trying to enable, wouldn't uh, force it back up. So, if so you can't enable it here before yeah. you can. If it is not enabled in the middle uh, CPU, you can't enable in the deep CPU. So if the threaded was unprivileged, like unshared user namespace, unprivileged, mm -hmm. and they try to do it, there's no, there's no way it could ask for that to be enabled. If, if this is not enabled here, then you can't enable it right. in, in the one below. And in the case of CPU controller, there is some performance costs associated with the uh, deep level nesting. So you have, uh, let's say, 
four level of um, four layer in the hierarchy. Each additional layer will add the courses to the CPU controller. There, there. And the courses, there are two main reasons for the performance, um, performance cost. Um, so be, first of all, there is more management overhead with, uh, and different level of nesting. And also, um, for each new CPU controller, you have to have some kind of um, um, statistical count about how much CPU resources consumed. They are shared by all the process within the CPU. And when you try to update it kind of simultaneously, it creates cache side contention problem that can slow down performance. And one of the proposed patch that uh, I sent upstream is what we call the bypass mode. Um, so um, uh, it's, it's still a proposed patch yet, yeah, and um, uh, I will have to uh, discuss with other team developers whether it's worthwhile to do it or not. Uh, because by um, turning V2, the state of controller is either on or off. Uh, and if you and with the bypass mode, um, we add a, a bypass mode. That, that means the controller is off in the middle cycle, but then you can, once it's in bypass mode, you allow the, the, your child to have it enabled. So in that way, you can skip some of the middle level if you really don't need the um, would, would, controller. Would that be for like a production use case? Like you would do this as a production use case, or is that like for break glass? Uh, yeah. Temporarily. Uh, the time reason for that is uh, for the CPU controller because of the overhead associated with the uh, with, uh, additional level of hierarchy. So you can have those controllers not, not being enabled in the middle layer, but then it, on, on the leap, you really need it, you can enable it there. And so effectively, you only have two levels instead of maybe four or five levels. And now I'm going to talk about each of the um, controller in CPU V2, the, the major one. Did you say that's been very good? Uh, uh, not yet. It's still being discussed. Uh, so yes. And so uh, the CPU V2 core managed, uh, is responsible for managing uh, all the courses how uh, within the, the SQL hierarchy. And, and within the core, you, you have a SQL controller file, which is a read only file listing all the, all the, okay, listing all the controller that are being enabled in that particular SQL. And then there's a SQL event file that are used by some management demon to know that changes have been made in the C group so that they can <coughs> add uh, accordingly. And then there's a math step to control how, how, how many level of hierarchy you are allowed to, to have. By default, it's max, which means there's no limit. But you can control how much level by specifying a, a numerical value into the math step. Um, <coughs> Max descendant is um, the maximum number of descendancy group you can create underneath it. It is for controlling purpose. So you can't have too many C group created underneath it if you don't want to. And then the C group process is a file listing all the PID of all the process that belong to the, that C group. And the way of moving process from one C group to the other is to echo the PID into the, the pop file. And then there's a stack file that shows you um, the number of uh, visible and dying SQL, uh, design this SQL that you have, and subject control, I talked about it previously, uh, about how, <coughs> what controller need to be enabled in the child SQL uh, level. And the SQL thread uh, is used for uh, uh, in threaded mode, where you can move one thread to another, um, another SQL and leave all the other thread behind in the original SQL. So this is a new control file that are created for the, the thread mode. And SQL type is for thread mode management, as I uh, talked about previously. 
And for the CPU controller, uh, you used to control how much CPU time to be allocated to each of the process in SQL. And in the, <coughs> and the CPU, the V1 CPU account controller are integrated into V2 controller uh, in V2. So there's no more separate CPU account controller. They're all in the CPU controller right now. And the CPU map is a uh, two value file listing. Um, it's for CPU maps is for bandwidth control. So it will allow you to control how much CPU time um, you are allowed to run within the, the given period. And this number are in terms of uh, microsecond. So here, when you say max, it means that there's no limit within a 100 millisecond period. So within 100 millisecond, uh, you will see how much time um, the CPU the process within the CPU uh, consume. If you set a web numerical here instead of max, then you exceed the limit. It will force uh, the process to go to sleep and not allow to run until the next period starts. And the CPU A file is for controlling um, the CPU contention between different C group. So depend, the one with the high rate will have more CPU time allo allocated to it. So you have two C group. One have say uh, a rate of 200 and, and one have 100. That means um, of the CPU time available, two thirds will go to the second C group and one third will go to the, the first C group. And CPU rate 9 is another way of uh, controlling the, uh, the value. In this case, you use, uh, you use similar scaling at the nice command that we have on uh, the command line. Okay, um, CPU with uh, CPU set controller. Um, in this, in the, for CPU set, you can control what CPU are associated with each of C group. And, but the list of CPU requests doesn't mean that you, you will get them all. So depending on what CPU available, currently available, and in the, by, uh, in the parent, um, the group of CPU requested may not be all granted to you. The actual CPU that you are allowed to run at the moment is in the CPU effective uh, uh, file. <coughs> and similarly, for memory, um, what, what memory node you are allowed to use is controlled by the CPU mem and, and the CPU effective. And there's a new feature in V2, it's called the CPU partition, which you can, is used by some of the real-time um, processes, because in, in, in real-time management, some process may want to have exclusive uh, set of CPU that are run by, the, by those real-time process only, and other process, we don't want other process to interfere with them, so, so we create a CPU partition uh, for the CPU set to, to do exactly that. And then we have the memory um, controller. And you can see that the naming convention are more consistent here. So you have uh, mean, mean the, which is the, uh, the minimum memory that you're guaranteed to have before um, an OM won't happen if the memory consumption is below the limit. And low is the um, is the soft memory limit, and then you have a high, which is the, uh, the limit, soft limit where you, you <coughs> memory retain will happen. You will exceed that uh, limit, then you will try to retain some of memory. And then you have the max, which is the absolute limit, so you can't go higher than that. Uh, you try to go higher than that, and memory retain, can't retain those memory back. Uh, OOM killer will be invoked to, to kill some of the process. And I won't go into the rest, um, I'm running out of time. And then there's an IO controller. Again, you can see that the naming concerns are very consistent. You have the weight, which is used to control uh, one C group versus the other C group, how much share you get um, relative to each other. And then there is a max that control what's the maximum byte per second and IO op per second that you can have uh, for processes within the C group. And within the IO controller, there is also some um, subcontroller. One is for controlling the, the white back, and the other one for controlling the IO latency. And C group namespace. The C group, oh, the missing space. 
Uh, Sigma namespace provides a mechanism to virtualize the view of the pop PIP C code file uh, and C code map. And C code V2 support the a special NS namespace delegate <coughs> option, which we consider C group namespace as delegation boundary. <coughs> so if you have this option enabled when you mount the C group V2, then and you use the C group namespace, then um, the, the process within that namespace who have the, the, the word privilege in that particular namespace will be allowed to manage up, will allow to manage the uh, SQL file moving process from one SQL to the other. Um, I'm supposed to give that some demo, but I think I already saw some of you uh, here, so I will just give it at the moment. And for well, um, we. For well 7, we are not going to support SQL V2 because the chain is just um, too, too dramatic that uh, you probably break a lot of things. So we are not planning to support SQL V2 in well 7. In well 8, uh, we are planning to support it. Um, the initial well 8 release, uh, because of the timing, um, it, it does not have all the required CPU uh, required controller available yet. So it will be in type preview only. Uh, we are hoping to offer support uh, SQL V2 in starting from well 8.1. Um, depending after we have done enough qualification to make sure that it really everything goes out, then we will uh, support that. Looking forward, um, we are we are going to see SQL V2 adoption rate um, getting um, gradually increases over time. And, and at the same time, c one will still stay on for a rather long period of time because uh, there's, as I showed you in the presentation, there are some differences between V1 and V2, and not all the application may be easily moved from V1 to V2, so we will allow uh, V1 and V2 to be exist at the same time, but for, each, for one particular system, you can have either choose to use V1 or V2, or in some case, combination of, of both. Um, so uh, we will see how things work out and decide what to do next. And feature, we are expecting to have more feature available in V2 uh, as long as there's a solid requirement for that. Um, but at the, at the current moment, is the feature set is quite minimal. Um, it's the core one that we typically use, but you need new feature. Um, you have to raise your wall and request that to be available in V2. And most is true, uh, I think it's going to support SQL V1 and V2 in some way for, for a rather long period of time. Okay, um, that's the end of my presentation. Any question? Yeah? Do you, do you know of efforts going on to help with eBPF not requiring a full compile tool chain? Uh, for EBPF, um, uh, okay. Uh, you are asking whether EBPF uh, required for SQL? Well, because device and that, that I.O. Mm -hmm. are being encouraged for EBPF, yes, currently I that requires a full tool chain. So, like, I'm not going to put GCC on my firewall. Mm -hmm. So, is there effort going on to for not requiring compiler toolchain on those nodes. I see. Um, I don't know yet. Um, EBPF development is rapidly changing, and so um, it's hard to say whether we need to compute toolchain or not. Uh, Turning EBPF, I think it's better support by CLAN rather than GCC. GCC support it. Well, I'm just saying, I'm planning for GCC. I don't want it on, on some of the hosts. Yeah, I understand your point, but um, in most cases, um, I think that the disk should will provide the EBPF program <coughs> for you instead of a uh, user doing the EBPF themselves. And we are thinking, most likely scenario is that we already provide a set EBPF program <coughs> that you can just load it and use it instead of doing it on your own. Uh, any other question? Okay, 
If not, and thank you for your presence, and uh, hopefully, uh, uh, hopefully, I will come back in the, maybe next year again and see you, guys. Okay.